Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And from Exodus chapter 34, the first nine verses. The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablet which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their for the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. O Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we continue in worshiping you, as we attend to your word this morning, Father, we ask for grace that you would tune our hearts, our ears, our minds, that we would worship you that we would hear what you are speaking to us, that we would see your word living and active, and that by your spirit, you would draw us close to yourself, and that you would lead us as you are our God. We pray this, trusting in your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The prayer that perhaps you have prayed that is the ironic prayer, uh, not ironic as far as the ironic blessing, but the ironic prayer that you would pray of saying, Father, give me patience and give it to me now, is one that we would not too quickly pass by. That we would understand and know that as we seek to be patient, we know that that is not only a desire that we should have, but it's a desire that we do have. It's perhaps maybe the prayer that you pray more often is, Father, would you make the people around me more patient? (laughs) That as they deal with me and they see, see my foibles and my difficulties and the challenges that I bring, that you would give them patience. Maybe that is your prayer for your spouse as you wake in the morning. Father, make my wife patient with me, a sinner in her presence. Uh, And as wives, you you pray, uh, Father, make me patient for my husband. Uh, And husbands, the same. This is what we are not only called to, but as we read in Galatians, who we are in Christ. Who we are in those that have the indwelling spirit. Throughout all of this series, we are looking at a call that... Paul is giving, not unique to the Galatians, but the call that Paul is giving to the church to walk and keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit that has been given, the Spirit that is freely given, uh, the Spirit that makes us alive in Christ, also then sanctifies us. 
and grows us, that we would become more and more like Christ. And so as we read in Galatians 5, uh, we can read these uh, nine attributes of the fruit of the Spirit, these characteristics that, uh, that are pointing to the reality of the Spirit at work in the body, that these are things that are seen. We can look at these and look at them in, in, in triplets, really. Uh, you can look at the first three, uh, that as we, we read them in the pages of uh, Galatians, that uh, love, joy, and peace go together uh, in, a, in a pretty close way. That those are more indwelling, that we, those are attributes that would be lo- looking inwards, uh, facing as we look outwards, kind of a, from an inward, outward perspective. But these next three, starting with patience, are are really more the friction points of how we would get along with those in the body of Christ. You know, the call that Paul gives to the Galatians is that they would not provoke one another, that they would get along with one another, that they would live at peace with one another. Uh, And so we see the first of these being patience that he lists, but this is not in a vacuum. As we'll see this morning, there are connection points with all of these because it's the one and same spirit, so we should not be surprised. But as we consider patience this morning, we need to understand and see that God is the one, that the spirit who indwells us, this one and same God, the Holy Spirit, Uh, that we see the same characteristics from the Father, the same characteristics from the Son. So we look together this morning at Exodus 34, that we would see and know this God in his patience as he has revealed himself to his people. As we look through this passage this morning, as we walk through it, uh, we need to see at least three aspects of patience. Uh, we'll take a look and consider uh, that patience is, is really a display of grace, a display of grace, that patience uh, connects with other attributes. It's not something that we can separate out on its own, but it really is connected with others, and that uh, patience requires a response, that patience requires a response. So first, As we look together, we see that patience is the display of grace. We began reading in Exodus 34, verse 1, that the Lord called to Moses. That as Moses met with the Lord, that he called Moses up to the mountain. Now, this is not the beginning of this account, for sure. Uh, We look even at the end of chapter 33, that this is what the Lord um, is is doing in in calling uh, calling Moses to come. In fact, it's actually uh, at at the request of Moses, uh, that Moses, who has gone up to the mountain, as the people have gathered, he's received the the uh, tablets of testimony that God himself has carved, uh, the Ten Commandments, the two tablets being two because it is uh, the covenant that God is making with his people. Uh, It's not the Charlton Heston uh, Ten Commandments where five is on one and five are on the other, uh, but it is actually all ten on both of them. Because in the ancient Near East, the people of God would understand this. This is a covenant made between God and his people that this covenant is made. And so in in a covenant process, you would each keep a copy of the covenant so that if one breaks it, you can bring the evidence to the other party and say, look, you promised to do this and you have not kept your end of the covenant and therefore the curses that were pronounced in the covenant are upon you. But God doesn't keep one of the covenants. He gives both of them to the people of God. And this is a sign that says, I am the covenant-keeping God. I am the God who makes the covenant. I do not need to keep a copy of this covenant. They're both yours as a testimony to my faithfulness to you. But what occurred? As God gave these two tablets to Moses, 
While Moses was meeting on the mountain, while the thunder and lightning and fire were raining on the mountain, the people of God looked up and a rather relatively short time declared, Moses isn't coming back. Aaron, go ahead and and form an, an idol that we can worship God here because we don't know what happened to Moses. And uh, as, as we record, or as we, we read in the, the recording, that when Moses came down and questioned what happened, that Aaron, uh, in, in one of the more um, funny uh, portions of Scripture, that Aaron would even say this, uh, but that Aaron, in response, said, the people of God wanted this. And out of the fire came this golden calf. I, I don't know how this happened, Moses. That sounds like something you would say to a brother, though. Uh, I don't know what happened, brother. But Moses, as he comes down the mountain, actually as as God tells him uh, what is happening, and he comes down the mountain to see the people, he throws the tablets down, breaking them. Uh, Really as a sign of saying, you are a stiff-necked people. You are a people that do not want this God. You are a people that what God has done for you means nothing to you. That as God has shown his power through the ten plagues in Egypt, as God has shown his power in leading you by a pillar of cloud at day and pillar of uh, fire at night, as he's led you across the Red Sea on dry land, as he's brought you to the mountain of Sinai, that you as his people would be so unfaithful so quickly. But what do we see here? And that's what, in in Exodus 34, we see the patience of God displayed in his grace, in the commitment to his people. That's what we need to understand and, and see here, that God is showing the commitment to his people, despite the disobedience, despite making an idol made to look like an animal that they would worship. Even though they were attributing uh, the God that that brought them out, they were making a God and an image that was not God. One of the very commandments breaking, the very first two commandments uh, that, that God has given in the 10. But despite the disobedience, God remains committed to his people. In fact, so committed that he is calling Moses to chisel out another two tablets that he will again write on. God himself will write on these. He calls Moses to come up to himself onto the mountain. He really is fulfilling his promise. It's a commitment. Patience comes from a commitment to the promise. There's a need here for the law as well. It's not just that this is a, a covenant um, that, that God is making that people would know, but it's what is in the covenant. What is in the covenant is the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words that God would, would show them uh, how then they should respond to God, what, they, what they're needing of in interacting with God, but also then what they're doing and what they need to do in interacting with mankind. We see that this is then summarized uh, by Christ himself saying, this then is how you should live, that you would love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, that you would love others as yourself. This is a need that we have, the people of God have, of having the law being told to them. Why? Because they're sinners. It's not been too many pages in our Bibles that the, the whole world has been destroyed by floodwaters because of the evil that is in the hearts of mankind. Not wanting to be living according to God's law, not wanting to even understand God's law, not knowing God's law. In fact, even though they are without an excuse because they see the creation, as Paul tells us in Romans 1, they reject it. This is what leads uh, God through the prophets to declare that 
there will be one day where we don't need the law because the law will be written on our hearts because of the Spirit indwelling us. But there's a need for the law. The people of God need to know what is right and wrong uh, because they need to know and hold on to what is right. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the very first uh, sin of, of pride, saying, I can take something unto myself that is God's and God's alone, and that is to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, Adam and Eve only knew good. They only knew the law. They only knew what was right in God's sight. And now, because of our sin, uh, our, our, our free will, uh, as it's, as it's uh, said in our, our, our confession, is that we would pursue, in, in, our, in of ourselves, in our sinful nature, we only pursue what is sinful. That is our nature. That is the law unto ourselves, that we would follow according to our own ways. And so we need the law of God. God chose his patience in his grace by giving the law to his people of what they are in need of. But we also then need to understand that in this display of grace, that patience is actually in relation to anger. At the heart of it, that's really what patience is. Now, maybe that anger is coming from a place of disappointment or frustration or maybe even some fear, but it really is a relation to anger. In fact, even the, the wording uh, that, uh, that is used here, that the word that gets translated as patience is really actually long-nosed. Uh, that when God says, I am the Lord and I am patient, the, the phrase there, it's a Hebrew idiom, that basically means that it is long-nosed. And that sounds weird to us, uh, but if you understand where it's coming from, anger is actually hot-nosed, um, which is very descriptive, isn't it? Uh, that when you are angry with someone, your nose gets hot. <laughs> that it's, it's anger. It burns. And that's what ang God's wrath burns against evil. He is right in his anger. But here he is showing patience, meaning that his nose is not getting hot, but it's actually long. That even uh, we look at this and we say God's patience, his forbearance, his long suffering with his people, that this is a grace. This is not deserved. Now, your anger and my anger, uh, I'll say 99.999% of the time, but, but really probably mostly 100% of the time. Our anger is almost never righteous. God's anger, anger and wrath always is. And so when he brings his, when he brings his wrath upon uh, evil, it is always just and right. When he brought his wrath upon the earth and destroyed it by flood, it was right. But you see the patience of God displayed in the pages of Scripture as well. When the people of God go into the, uh, the promised land, uh, God says, you are there to destroy the people because their anger has gone to the end of what I am willing to abide with. It is risen to the point of being punished. God's patience is a display of grace. We see this uh, reminding, reminding us, even in the, the letter that Peter writes, of saying, God is not willing that any should die. But God shows his patience, his forbearance, that even though there are those that would say, the Lord is not returning, the Lord is not coming back, he would have come back by now, surely, if he was coming back, that Peter says the, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is going to return. The, the Lord will make all things right. The Lord will gather his people unto himself, all that are part of the body of Christ. And so... The Lord is showing patience. The Lord is showing patience because he is redeeming those even now today that are far off. Even now today that are, as Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us, are objects of wrath. That he is then redeeming and making objects of peace 
and love and communion with himself. This is a display of God's patience. But patience is not just a display of grace in these pages as far as the Lord working with his people, uh, being kind to his people, even being kind to Moses in, in bringing him up and uh, revealing himself uh, to him. But we see it in the de- declaration itself in verse 5. As Moses goes up to the mountain, he takes the stones, he's obedient, he goes up. And then we read that the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And as he passes over Moses, and and he tells Moses this is what he's going to do in chapter 33. He says, you cannot see my face, but I will put my hand over the cleft of the rock and I will pass in front of you and then you can... You can see as I, as I go away. But as the Lord passes in front of Moses, Moses hears the declaration of who God is. That God himself reveals his character. This is the patience of God not being just by itself, but being understood in relation to all the character of God. So we see the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. You see, the Lord displays his character that it's not just about patience. It's not just about forbearance. It's, it's not that God is the one who is just going to be a doormat and be walked over. No, the Lord is patient on purpose. The Lord is long-suffering, and it's connecting with his other attributes. And even here we see what, what God is revealing to Moses is repeated many, many, many times throughout the Old Testament. And maybe one of the the best ones that we can understand and see this is on the lips of Jonah. That Jonah, that uh, unwilling prophet who's sent to Nineveh, who's told to go and proclaim uh, uh, the the destruction of Nineveh, that, that that Jonah is sent to proclaim God's justice as a prophet of God. And Jonah goes, finally, finally he goes after being spat up onto the shore from the whale, finally gets convinced that as he goes to Nineveh, as he proclaims and he walks around the city, and you'll remember that as he's walking around the city, he's just saying, Nineveh, in 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. All of you are going to be destroyed. And you almost hear on the, on the, uh, the lips of Jonah, as you get to know Jonah in, in, the, prophet, uh, in, in, the, in the book, you almost get the, the sense of saying, he's relishing in it. I can't wait for the Lord to destroy you. And we see that's exactly what he does. After he's walked through the city, uh, the vast city, he goes and sits on the hilltop. Uh, and he sits there Because he's waiting and expecting the fire from heaven to come down and rain down and eat up this truly evil people. They were an evil people. But what does God do? God works in the hearts and minds and the Ninevites repent. Not because Jonah promised them, if you repent, God will relent. But because in confronted with the reality of God's wrath, the people there said, Who knows? Maybe God will relent. But they confess that they were a wrathful people. What is Jonah's response? Jonah's response is actually one of anger, frustration. He's upset. In fact, he even tells God, uh, as God comes to him, Jonah says, this is why I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. Because I know your character. I know that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. So I didn't want to go because I know this is, this is the kind of God you are, that you would relent and that you would not punish this people. From the heart, 
of that prophet that was misguided and not understanding God's character, we see the truth that God is this God. That as God reveals himself to Moses, that there are all these characteristics of God, that his attributes as he reveals himself to us is not just patience. We would do well to understand and, and we'll consider, uh, even as we, we think about a few of these in the, the list of the, the fruit of the Spirit, but that God is compassionate and gracious. That God is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That God does maintain love to thousands of generations, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. However, we also need to understand that God's character is one of just and justice. And he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will not leave what needs to be punished unpunished, according to his own character, his own righteousness. You see, God's attributes are always full. God does not diminish his love in order to work his justice. God does not diminish his faithfulness in order to work his mercy. God is full in all of his attributes all of the time. And so we, we look at this and we say, we see the attributes of God as uh, these, these attributes, these characteristics, the same spirit is the one who is in the body of Christ. These same uh, attributes are in the Son of God as he proclaimed the good news. What was his proclamation? All of the Gospels recount this, at least in summary, in parts of the Gospel. The Lord went about and he proclaimed the kingdom. And what did he proclaim? Repent and believe. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, the kingdom of God is, is a glorious thing for those who are in the kingdom, a glorious thing for those who have been redeemed, a glorious thing for those who long for the king to be present. But the kingdom of God is a truly fearful thing for those who do not want to meet the king, for those who are far off, and for those who are uh, not wanting to be associated with the king of kings. In fact, even as we look at the, the revelation that was given to Apostle John in Revelation, that this is the very characteristic of those kings that in the, in the final day that the kings will call down and, and look for rocks to fall down on themselves because they, that's how desperately they do not want to stand face to face with the God of heaven. They would rather all, have all manner of horrible things happen to them than to face the true, righteous, and just God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what you stand outside of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ took the wrath upon himself that was due to all sinners. That as he took that upon himself on the cross, that he bore the weight of sin that he bore the, the distance and, and the wrath that was due for all of sinful humanity. For all that would come unto him, your sins are forgiven. The grace is yours because of what Christ has done. Patience connects with all of God's attributes that in his love, he shows his patience. It's not a cold-hearted patience. It's not a calculated, meticulous patience. It is a loving, generous patience that God shows to his people. And finally, we see that the patience then requires a response. Here, the Lord, as he passes before Moses, uh, Moses cannot help but respond. Moses cannot help but say something about being in God's presence and hearing the proclamation of who God is. And so Moses goes back to what he had uh, asked. In fact, goes back to even what, what God had, had, what 
God had prompted Moses to ask in chapter 33 uh, that, that the Lord said, I'm not going to go with you up to the promised land. This is a stiff-necked people, which was really to draw out Moses saying, Lord, if you don't go up with us, why would we go? And here, again, uh, the, the first response that Moses has, as the Lord passes by, the first response that Moses has is to acknowledge God's patience. He says, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, recognizing God didn't need to show favor to Moses. There wasn't something that Moses did to earn God's favor. This was God's mercy. This was God being patient. And, and really, as, as the, uh, the, the Israelites' representative and kind of uh, in, in, in God's presence, the, the mediator, that he is standing in the gap on behalf of his, the, God's people, saying, Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, recognizing your patience, would you go up with us? You see, resp the response to God's patience first requires a response towards God himself. That when we see God's patience at work in us, when we see God's patience toward us, that it is right and good and really required that we would give thanks to God. This is God's work. We would do rightly to acknowledge of what God has done, that we would acknowledge rightly of who God is. This is something that we're going to be able to do forever. <laughs> we will not be en encumbered by what is uh, sinful. Uh, we will not be encumbered by those things that... Uh, the, the tears that come to our eyes because of the brokenness that sin causes. But we will stand before God recognizing God's true character, not just his patience. But can you imagine uh, even what eternity is going to be like recognizing and worshiping God for how he was patient with his people as the veil is pulled back? And Scripture doesn't tell us exactly all that we'll know, uh, but can you imagine being able to see and being have brought to your mind, being told, this is how I was patient. We have it recorded for us in God's word, but this is not the total of how God has been patient with his people. This is not the total of how he's been patient with you, a sinner saved by grace, that we have the opportunity in eternity to rejoice in God's patience. And that is what Moses does. He worships. He worships before God. God has shown his patience. And so we do rightly to recognize God's patience, to not be stiff-necked, meaning that we refuse to bow our heads before him, that we would refuse to acknowledge his sovereignty and instead look to our own. This is... What happens uh, and what, what the writer of Hebrews is pointing back to uh, when in Hebrews chapter 3, the people of God are encouraged with these words. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Do you realize that what the writer of Hebrews is pointing out, quoting the, the Psalms there, hasn't even happened yet in Exodus 34? God in his patience is knowledgeable and already knows because he's outside of time and space. He knows the ways that we are going to be unfaithful. He knows the ways that the people of his people, the Israelites, were going to be unfaithful. And God was patient. But that patience is not devoid and is not uh, away from the other attributes of God's justice and wrath. 
And so it is right that we would recognize God's patience. It is right that we would recognize others' uh, patience as well. And so that's the, the second aspect of what's required. First, we need to recognize God's patience. That uh, requires a response toward God, but it requires a response toward other people. And this is, a, this is at least twofold. One, we need to recognize the patience that we are required to have towards others. We are not God. <laughs> we do not carry all the attributes that God carries. The Lord has not called us to, as independent uh, contractors, to exercise God's wrath on people for the ways that they break his commandments. But he has called us to have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. That we would have patience with one another. And that's the... the really what Paul is getting at in Galatians chapter 5. As we love one another, we will show our love in concrete ways, one of which is being patient. You know, that's the thing that goes immediately out the window, perhaps literally, not just figuratively, as you're driving your car. The patience that you show to those that you don't know. The patience that you show to those that are online uh, and maybe typing in a forum or putting a comment on a news article and, and maybe you don't write a comment, but maybe in your mind you say, what a fool. The Lord cautioned us in the words and the sentiment that we would have in our own hearts that if we call one a fool in our hearts, what we stand in judgment of. We, we are called to patience toward others. Why? Because God has lavished his patience on us. Now, this patience toward others, that's what, what Moses is, is calling for. Moses is looking and, and seeing the patience that, that he is calling for for the people. He was mad at the people for, for doing this. He was mad at the people for creating this, uh, this idol as he was gone upon the mountain. He was upset. But Moses taking his, really his cues from God, showing, seeing that God has been patient, says to God that you, uh, o, o Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Moses is calling out and saying, Lord, you have to go with us. It's, Mo, God has already offered to Moses, I'll just raise up a new people through you. Moses, you're my guy. I'm going to take you and I'll raise my new people. But Moses has already responded and said, no, it, it, this is your promise, Lord. That God was prompting him to even respond in that way. It is toward others. James calls us to, the, to, to this in, in James chapter 1. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That we will be patient with one another. And it's not just in a, because it's pragmatic. Moses is not just thinking, I got to get, my, my assignment is get this people of God to the promised land. It's only going to work if God goes with us. So God, you have to go with us in order for us to get the people of God to the promised land. I can't do this on my own. Well, that's true. But that's not at the heart of what Moses is asking for. What's at the heart is the same heart that we would have, that we would see God's glory displayed in his work with his people. We sang this morning, uh, and we heard this morning from Matthew chapter 5, of that the people of God are a city on a hill, that they shine before men. The works are evident of who you are. It's, it's not just a matter of pretending. You, you can't help but it being seen. This is how God works. The ways that you work toward others display the spirit of God at work in you. And so we do rightly to act the way that we are, to not just create something out of nothing, but to be who you are, Paul says, to be clothed, to act as you are clothed in Christ and to put on Christ and to put off falsehood. So how we act toward others is extremely important, but 
then finally, the requirement of acting toward peace is toward the future. The, the future that Moses is looking at most directly here is going into the promised land. That, that he would go with the people, even though that they are a stiff-necked people. That he's asking for forgiveness for our wickedness and our sin. And take us as your inheritance. Notice that Moses is not saying these people. <laughs> Moses is not saying that person or, or this group. And I'm certainly not like them. But he's saying us. In the same way that Daniel, when he was taken off into Babylon, and as he prayed faithfully three times a day, part of his prayer was seeking forgiveness. Including himself in the ways of the unfaithfulness of his forefathers. Because he knew his own heart. He knew that he was in need. That he was not faithful in the way that uh, God is faithful. So it's, it's really toward the future. This is, this is longing for, this is in the, in the here and now, that we long for what Christ is doing, that he will return. And while we are waiting, while we're being patient, again, James reminds us in James chapter 5, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is at hand, beloved. This is not something that the Lord will tarry long. From our perspective, it does seem like a long time. It's been 2,000 years already. But the Lord will return, and he will return soon. And so we would do right that we would be patient, but patience does not mean inactive. Patience means establishing your hearts for the coming of the Lord, that we would respond to God's patience with us by establishing our hearts and waiting for him. You know, when you wait for someone, what do you do? Perhaps you look at your watch and say, oh, why aren't they here? If you're waiting outside and you're, you've pulled up and you're giving them a ride to someplace, maybe while you're waiting, while you're being patient, you give the horn a little honk and say, I'm being patient here, but you can hurry it up. What does it mean to establish your hearts that you would be patient? It means that you would wait on the Lord. Whatever the Lord does is good. Whatever the, the Lord's timing is good. That's for his return. But we would do right to apply this to the other areas of our lives as well. Lord, I am waiting for you to fix this thing in my life. I am waiting for you to bring me some sort of relief in this area. I am waiting for you, God, you can do this. I know that you can. I'm waiting on you. It's right to wait on the Lord but you may be waiting your entire life. And that's not a deficiency of God. It's a call for you to wait on him. It's a call for you to wait on him, even as you interact with those around you, even as you long for Christ's return. Beloved, this is the call that you have, the call to be patient, not because you can create it, not because there's some understanding that you can uh, gain, that you can unlock some secret door. But this is yours in Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. The Spirit of God who indwells the church, the body of Christ, is already at work in you in patience. And so it is your call to follow him, to seek his face, to love him, to show this patience, to respond to God's patience towards you and to share that with those around you, that whether they're in the faith or out of the faith, that we can see him and know him. Know this, God has been gracious to you and, to show, and showing his patience. And so we do right in showing that graciousness toward others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the call that you have on us as a, as a body of Christ. 
that you, who have shown your patience toward a people that is stiff-necked and proud, you who has shown patience in working in the hearts and minds, have called us to show this patience to those that you have called in the body of Christ, that we would be long-suffering, knowing and seeing outside of uh, what we see in this world, but you would give us eyes to see your return and that we would be drawn to that and motivated by that, not for any spotlight on us, but for Christ to be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.